be doing a drama based on Luke 24, 13 through 35. And this is based on the message paraphrase, The Road to Emmaus. That same day, you ready? <laughs> that same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were not able to recognize who he was. What is it that you were discussing so intently? They just stood there, long-faced, like they'd lost their best friend. Are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happened during the last few days? What has happened? The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death and crucified him. And we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. And it's been three days, and we're more confused than ever. Because early this morning, some women were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with a story that they had seen a vision of angels who said Jesus was alive. Then some of the men went off to the tomb to check and found it empty. Just like the women said, but no one saw Jesus. So thick-headed, so slow-hearted. Why can't you simply believe all that the prophets have said? Can't you see that the Messiah needed to suffer these things before he came into his glory? Then Jesus started at the beginning with the books of Moses and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that had referred to him. They came to the edge of the village where they were headed, and Jesus acted as if he were going on. Stay and have supper with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is done. So Jesus went in with them, and here's what happened. He sat down at the table with them, taking the bread he blessed and broke and gave it to them. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him, and then he disappeared. Back and forth they talked. Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us? On the road as he opened up the scriptures for us? They didn't waste a minute. They were up and on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and their friends gathered together, taking away saying, it's really happened. The master has been raised up. Simon saw him. Then the two went over everything that happened on the road and how they recognized Jesus when he broke the bread. As you may know, if you heard last week's sermon, don't worry, I'm not taking attendance, children, but if you heard last week's sermon, you know that I once attended a retreat called The Walk to Emmaus. It's a three-day retreat to educate and inspire churchgoers like you, churchgoers like me, to, to really put hands and feet to our faith, to become more serious about our discipleship and our role to spread Jesus' message and to live Jesus' message as Christ's hands and feet. And even though I initially resisted the invitation to attend the retreat, I'm glad I finally gave in, because I met Jesus on that walk to Emmaus. Now, Jesus met me when I first arrived at the retreat, and they made us remove our watches, hand it over to a host who said, We'll take care of you this weekend. I was a little nervous. I will say it didn't feel like Jesus at the moment. I'm like, I, those days I live by my watch. Nowadays I live by my iPhone. But I thought, well, how am I going to know when to be anywhere? And the host said, you don't have to worry about a thing this weekend. No schedule, no calendar. We're going to take care of you. Well, that actually is a pretty good way to start a retreat when you're somebody like me who lives by their calendar and their clock. 
It wasn't an easy way to start the retreat, but it was a good way to start the retreat. But an even better way was then they welcomed us into this beautifully decorated church fellowship hall where this amazing dinner was laid out for all of us, reminding me of our traditional Monday Thursday dinner here, which hopefully we'll be celebrating next year on Monday Thursday. It was a feast for the eyes and for the stomach. And after we finished the feast, and then we all, it's a women's retreat, we all got up to start clearing dishes, and they sat us back down and said, no, no, you don't do any work this weekend. We take care of you. And in those first few hours of the retreat, time just fell away. And I was able to be fully present to the retreat experience, fully present to whatever happened in that evening as we began our lessons and prayers together. And I felt even more present the next morning when I awoke not to an alarm clock, but to the yummy smell of fresh roasted coffee and a really delicious breakfast being prepared. I'm getting, I'm thinking you probably know we didn't go hungry that weekend. Every time we turned around, there was another meal or there was a table full of snacks and desserts. But we also didn't go hungry in our soul because there was always a prayer partner hovering somewhere nearby or a facilitator to help us if, we, if our group had questions or were having trouble navigating the lesson. There was always an empty room if you just wanted to wander off alone to pray and think. And there was always a listening partner in case you needed somebody to talk to. If any of us felt a chill, suddenly a blanket or a sweater was wrapped around our shoulders. And if a pin didn't write, someone handed us one. Back in the days when we could hand each other pins. All weekend, the Emmaus retreat took care of our every need. Every host there to serve and care for us. To show kindness and hospitality. To offer friendship and conversation. Imagine 50 women, church women, who are used to caring for everybody else, their churches, their homes, their workplaces, their kids, just being taken care of all weekend long. It was a weekend of pure agape love, flowing endlessly. That is the surrounding ambiance of the walk to Emmaus Retreat. I have never felt as cared for as I did during those three days. Through their loving care, through their kindness and their hospitality, they brought Jesus into our very midst. At every meal, as we broke bread together, every homemade cookie we enjoyed, every hug or quiet prayer that they shared with us was another experience of Christ in our midst. That's how the retreat is designed, to offer each participant that which Cleopas and his companion offered to this stranger that they met on their walk to Emmaus. Kindness and hospitality that they showed to this stranger. Friendship and conversation that they shared with this man they thought they had never met. And then at the end, they invite the stranger in to have dinner, even to spend the night to find the shelter for day is done. And in their hospitality, in their kindness, as he breaks bread with them, blesses it, ah, now they meet the risen Christ. They recognize this is no stranger. This is Christ Jesus. Christ came to them in their hospitality and their kindness. Christ came to me in that retreat because of the leader's hospitality and kindness. It isn't the kind of retreat that's led by big spiritual gurus or famous speakers or great theologians, but led by people who love. Love God and love a bunch of us strangers as if 
we were their very closest friends. It's that type of loving hospitality that the two disciples offer to Jesus on the road to Emmaus and when they arrive home at Emmaus. Then they see Jesus. Not because they were the wisest disciples. We don't have any books written by them. Not because they were the best trained disciples or that even part of the inner circle. We never find out the name of the companion and we never hear about Cleopas ever again. But this unknown and this other unnamed disciple, each and normal, everyday follower of Jesus, much like you, much like me, they were two of the first to meet and recognize the risen Christ. And in the breaking of the bread, in the sharing of a meal together, they finally recognized who was in their midst. This is no stranger. This is Jesus. It's an unusual resurrection appearance. But one of the miracles and mysteries of this resurrection appearance is that it challenges us to see that it isn't our unshakable faith that reveals to us resurrection and the risen Christ. If you have doubts, Thomas knows all about those. Those are fine. It isn't even our deep spirituality. Much as we may work on that and work on our spiritual disciplines, it is not our deep spirituality that connects us with the risen Christ. Rather, it is our gestures of hospitality and kindness. That's the message of this resurrection story. For in those small gestures of hospitality and friendship, like breaking bread together, sharing a meal, sharing conversation, offering shelter, in those moments, the risen Christ was revealed to Cleopas and his companions. In those moments, the risen Christ is revealed to us. Now, I've known some of you for years, and I have seen you over the years show those sorts of gestures, the hospitality and kindness to one another, to family and friends, and even to strangers. By being the hands and feet of Christ, you have already made our community and our world a better place. And in doing so, you have brought the risen Christ into the presence of those who've received your hospitality. And you've also revealed the risen Christ to yourself. Ah, if only you recognize it. Don't be slow of heart or hardened of head as Cleopas and his companion were. Be awake and alert to how in those moments of hospitality and kindness and friendship, the risen Christ is with us. In this unexpected season, this congregation has inspired me even more. You have amazed me with your gestures of hospitality and kindness. Jim and Margaret and um, Alice providing masks for our eldest and most vulnerable members. Karen coming in here every week to sanitize this sanctuary so it is safe for those of us who are leading you in worship each Sunday. Jeff delivering cookies to Denise and others. Catherine and Lucy and Nancy preparing Easter baskets for people who were living alone that day. The youth writing letters to our older members. Dorothy and her family at the drop of a hat going to get groceries and delivering them to one of our members who couldn't afford groceries. Leslie Kazarian and her assistant league sisters helping a family shop for the clothing that they need. Lauren crafting and selling her jewelry to care for a feeding program. Kathy Ramming delivering milk and eggs and bread when this all started and staples were in short supply. And Kathy Hamilton coming in on Friday to fold and stuff a mailing so that Pam and I could have our day off. All of these gestures of hospitality and kindness, small and large, 
reveal Christ in our midst. They reveal Christ to us and to others. Jesus on the road, the risen Christ coming to meet us, the Christ in me seeing the Christ in you, and the Christ in you seeing the Christ in me. This is the heart and soul of the belief in the resurrection. The theologians can argue about body or no body. What we know as followers of Christ is that when two or three are gathered, Christ promises to be in our midst. And I would say to you, where two or three offer hospitality and loving friendship, Christ is in our midst. So as we break bread together this morning, whether you're pouring juice and eating a piece of bread at home or pouring water and eating a cracker or just preparing for Sunday lunch afterward, I invite you to reflect on the many gestures of hospitality and friendship, of kindness and generosity that are represented in the breaking of the bread. For Jesus instructed us to do this in remembrance of him in remembrance of the one who not only broke bread, but blessed children, welcomed strangers, forgave sinners, healed lepers, talked with outcasts, healed a friend's mother-in-law, and invited his closest friends to Passover dinner. It is this one whom we remember at the communion table this one who is the great host, invites us to the table that is the great feast, remembering that we are part of the feast every time we invite and welcome and love another. We are co-hosts with Christ in the gift of hospitality and friendship, God's love for all. May we be great hosts as we follow the great host.